There is no essential Christian doctrine that depends on the historicity of Genesis or, or anything uh, in the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible. The Christian faith depends on, on the resurrection of Jesus. There's almost a certain hesitancy to study the Bible because they're afraid that they're going to turn the page and find something they don't like. If the only reason you were believing in all this religion-y stuff is because you thought the Bible was nice, uh, then that belief is going to shatter immediately. Hey everyone, this is What Your Pastor Didn't Tell You. Today I'm on with Dr. Aaron Higashi. We're going to be talking about documentary hypothesis, what he considers to be evidence for, as well as how he is still Christian while believing in the documentary hypothesis. How are you doing today, Dr. Higashi? And can you give us a little bit about your background? I'm doing very well. I'm just, I'm still finishing off Thanksgiving uh, leftovers, <laughs> kind of rounder than I usually am, but no, I'm doing very well. Thank you for asking. Um, I'd be happy to talk about my background a little bit. Uh, my name's Aaron. I um, uh, I did most of my growing up in Colorado Springs, Colorado, um, where I went to study philosophy at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. I got very interested in moral philosophy in particular and how the Bible can be used in questions of moral philosophy. Uh, so I went on to pursue a master's degree in biblical studies. And then since you can't do anything with a master's degree in biblical studies, I went on to get a Ph.D., uh, in uh, in Hebrew Bible at Chicago Theological Seminary. And I just finished that uh, last year, last fall. Um, for the past uh, six, seven years now, I've been an adjunct faculty member at the College of Theology at Grand Canyon University in Arizona, uh, where I teach some courses in philosophy and ethics and Bible uh, and sort of introductions to Christian theology. Um, but uh, I have been on TikTok lately, making some Tiki Talks, uh, talking to people about Bible, just just trying to make uh, academic biblical scholarship more available uh, to people, sort of break that, um, break out of the ivory tower a little bit and, and get some of this information into people's hands. Yes, and that is very appreciated by a lot of people. Okay, so question for you. You are a Christian, correct? Uh, and yes. Do you, do you believe the Bible is inspired? Yeah, I do. I, I think that, um, I mean, there are a lot of different models of biblical inspiration, different ways of thinking about how it works. Um, I, I am most influenced by uh, an evangelical biblical scholar named Michael Bird, who has a dynamic model of biblical inspiration where God sort of uh, superintends the process of the Bible coming together, but doesn't necessarily give people the individual words that go into the text. There's a little bit more freedom there. Um, God makes sure the, the right uh, concepts uh, sort of make it into the text, uh, but not necessarily the right words. And so there, there's a there's a little bit more ambiguity in what the the Bible is allowed than in some other models of inspiration. Uh, but I definitely think the Bible is inspired. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. And this is this is going to be a big question for a lot of people. Do you think Genesis is historical? Uh, no, <laughs> no. Um, I think uh, Genesis one through eleven is pretty safely characterized as uh, mythology. Uh, and I think uh, 12 through 50 uh, are various kinds of legends. I think legendary material is probably the best. They have a, a, a they're set in um, uh, in plausible historical circumstances, but the details of the story, uh, the details of the stories are are either untrue or there's no real way to provide historical evidence for them. And so we have to remain perpetually agnostic about the truth in the end of the stories. But I don't think history is all, uh, is either the appropriate genre. I don't think the stories are attempting to tell history uh, so much as they are attempting to um, explain um, the relevance of these eponymous ancestors for a group of people a, a, a lot later on down in history. You know, why are these characters significant? Why is where does our religious faith come from? Uh, they have an etiological function. They're ex they're explaining where this religious faith comes from. They're not so much interested in doing what we think of as history today. Okay. And of course, you know, a lot of people are going to get, you know, a little anxious, like, oh gosh, this guy doesn't believe the Bible is historical. Um, I mean, question, when we're talking about this and specifically in regards to the documentary hypothesis, you know, it's a lot, of, a lot of people are going to be like anxious, a little worried, like, you know, I want to stay away from that. What advice would you give to them as someone who is a scholar, a Christian who thinks it is inspired, but still takes this view? Uh, a couple things. I mean, first, I would say that, you know, n nothing I have said or, or will say, I'm, I'm sure, in, in, in our little discussion today, 
uh, can possibly threaten the truth of Christian faith. I mean, there is no essential Christian doctrine that depends on the historicity of Genesis or, or anything uh, in the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible. Um, the, the Christian faith depends on, on the resurrection of Jesus, right? Um, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, if, if Christ is not raised, then our faith is in vain. Not if the new, not if the Old Testament is historical, then our faith is in vain, right? Um, so, I, I mean, whether or not the Trinity is true, whether or not the incarnation, the atonement, salvation by faith, none of that has anything to do with the historical reliability of the Old Testament or, or what genre we should properly characterize these stories in Genesis or uh, other places in the Pentateuch. Um, and that's not, not, that's not just me. That's, I mean, uh, even a pretty uh, conservative evangelical scholar like William Lane Craig will s say the same thing, that um, problems in the reliability of the Old Testament simply have nothing to do with whether or not God exists or whether or not, you know, um, the gospel is true. Um, those are in-house debates amongst Christians. Uh, you know, this this is our book. We can have those um, we can have those debates um, in in how we talk about it and what we think about it. And those debates are important, but at the end of the day, they have nothing to do with whether or not Christianity is true or not. Gotcha. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, nobody needs to worry. I don't think <laughs> I, they're, they're not going to walk away from this conversation being like, "Oh no, you know, Christianity is false." That's I don't even think that's that's on the table. Hey chat, subscribing to our YouTube channel allows us to help our watchers understand the Bible better. Thanks to your help, we have already reached thousands of people in their walk with Christ. If you'd like to help further our efforts, tap the subscribe button, which will allow us to reach even more people. Wait, they have to subscribe and click a bell now? Yeah, I mean, in that regard, we should be, we should be open to, you know, follow the evidence. You know, our faith isn't on the line here. Um, yeah. And, and our faith is only ever as good as the object of that faith is true. Right. So we, we should we should welcome challenges to um, perhaps some unexamined beliefs that we have about the Bible. Um, I think it's often the case that when people think something is challenging their religious faith, what, what it's really challenging is some unexamined beliefs that they have about the Bible. They, they have these unspoken expectations about what the Bible is like and how the Bible is fun functions. Um, and they find that this conversation challenges those beliefs. And so I, if a person's anxiety persists, even after, you know, I, 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 I reassure them, um, I, I think that's a good opportunity for them to ask themselves, like, what, what is it really that's, that's on the table here? What are you really worried about? Yeah, totally. Yeah. And also be aware of that, that, that feeling, that, that anxiety and like ask where that's coming from and all that. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So question. Uh, you know, what yes. is the documentary hypothesis? Uh, in brief, the documentary hypothesis is a theory about how the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, uh, were composed. Um, it's a theory that states that uh, originally there were four independent sources uh, written in very different times in different places by different people with very different and sometimes contradictory theologies um, that was then taken and edited together. Uh, at a later time after their composition. Um, the four sources are usually just referred to with letters J, E, P, and D, uh, and they all have very di distinct perspectives. They tell some of the same stories, and there are some stories that are unique to each of them, um, but it's the weaving together of these four stories that makes up the Pentateuch. That's what the documentary hypothesis, those are the four documents of the documentary hypothesis. So it, it's sort of uh, takes the place of the traditional idea of mosaic authorship. Gotcha. Okay. And um, yeah, obviously there's different variations of what people call the documentary hypothesis. So, I mean, I've, I've heard a lot of people say there's not really one documentary hypothesis. Um, can you talk about, uh, I guess, how that's typically used as well as just other, I guess, variations, maybe your view on it? Sure. Um, I mean, the the classical documentary hypothesis is basically what I just uh, laid out for you there. It's got four sources. Um, the, the classical documentary hypothesis was popularized at the end of the 19th century by Julius Wellhausen, a German biblical scholar. And for him, a really important part of the hypothesis wasn't just that there are these four sources that were edited together to make the Pentateuch, but that also that we could assign dates to these sources and that we could reconstruct the history of ancient Israelite religion with these four sources. So he lined them up, J first, E second, 
uh, D third and then P last. And he put forward the idea that ancient Israelite religion degenerated over time. It started off as this spontaneous, prophetic, uh, sort of emotional kind of religion, and then degenerated over time into a sort of state-sanctioned, legalistic, cultic kind of religion. And there was uh, a fair amount of uh, sort of anti-Semitic bias baked into that, the idea that sort of this ancient Jewish precursor was was getting worse somehow over time. Um, so that's sort of the classical uh, documentary hypothesis. Um, there's been a number of significant variations since then. Um, one is called the supplementary hypothesis, which, which was has an, has an older version, but was popularized in the 1970s in the English-speaking world by a scholar named Jan, uh, uh, John Van Cedars. Um, and he um, had very different ideas about the dates of these sources. Um, he thought that um, D... Uh, the uh, the D text was actually one of the the uh, the first ones um, that that P came after that, and that J and E were actually just the same source that was sort of put together in various fragments. Um, so instead of there being four originally independent documents, um, there was one there was one text that was then supplemented, hence the name supplementary hypothesis. One source that was then supplemented by two uh, significant additions. Um, and that's sort of backwards from the way that most documentary hypothesis uh, supporters sort of think of it. Um, but that's that's prominent in, in, in some parts of the English speaking world. And then there's a fragmentary hypothesis, which is which isn't really a single approach, but a variety of approaches that are really popular in Europe um, where we can't where the sources are made up of uh, uh, very tiny pieces, sometimes down to individual stories or individual characters, uh, tiny fragments, hence, hence the name of it. And so the Pentateuch is composed of all these fragments about which we, can, we, we can't generalize very much at all. Um, but all these, all these variations have in common some basic things, the idea that you know, the, 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 the Pentateuch was edited together out of a variety of independent sources, all that is held in common um, by all these different approaches. More, more recently, there's been what's called the neo-documentary hypothesis, uh, and that's what I'm sort of, I suppose, a proponent of, um, and that was popularized by Joel Baden and Jeffrey Stackert. Uh, and it's like the classical documentary hypothesis, except it takes the, the dating uh, and the reconstruction of ancient Israelite religion off the table. Uh, so it's a much simpler hypothesis. It doesn't try to explain more than just, here are our four sources, and, and what can we say about those four sources? And I, I think that simplicity is really to its benefit. It, it leads to less speculation. Uh, it's more concise. Um, it's it's easier to evidence. Um, so I think it's a stronger version of the hypothesis. Yeah, and of course, you know, a big issue a lot of people have that we'll kind of talk about is, you know, a lot of people complain that it's very, uh, very speculative. It's like oh, you can't say that's the date specifically. You know, that doesn't. You can't definitely yeah. say that, but, you know, if you're not making those types of claims, then, you know, a lot more people are going to have less issue with it. So in that case, it's a lot better. Um, exactly. Yeah. So uh, in regards to the reliability, um, you know, the original documentary hypothesis, you know, proposed that the, these sources were written way later, at least compiled way later. Um, you know, and if it's compiled later, that means that it can be changed. It has a lot more time to change. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that just happens through history if you have really late sources, essentially. Um, yeah. So can you talk about the reliability of um, how the documentary hypothesis would affect the Torah? Well, I, I suppose uh, the documentary hypothesis probably reduces the historical reliability of, of, of the Torah or the Pentateuch. Um, having said that, I don't think the historical reliability of the Torah would be very high in the absence of the documentary hypothesis. So you're sort of, um, th that's sort of the least of our concerns when it comes to the historical reliability. Uh, I mean, most most of the narratives in the, in the Torah are either the kind that would leave no evidence behind for us to be able to verify them because they're about like a single family, you know, almost 4,000 years ago, um, or the evidence for it isn't very good to begin with. Like th there's not a lot in the way of evidence when it comes to the Exodus, for example. Um, so even if we were to somehow put forward a single author very close to the events for these stories, 
I, I mean, you would still have a Torah that that is that is not particularly historically reliable, at least as far as most most scholars would evaluate it. So I, I don't think, I mean, we're, we're I, I don't think the documentary hypothesis is is going to sort of swing it from super reliable to unreliable. Uh, it's it's going to take it from not particularly reliable or at least questionable to slightly more questionable, I suppose. So I kind of assumed that you would make the argument that like, you know, they weren't really concerned as much with history at this time period, but you're kind of saying no. that we don't have as much to verify. Well, it seems like what you're saying is you, we don't have as much historically speaking to verify these claims that, um, you know, so, so we don't really have much reason to think that it's historical to begin with. Like, um, do you see what I'm getting at there? Yeah, I, I just, I mean, it, it depends on, I mean, there are different kinds of reliability, but for us to be able to confirm, for example, that a story in Genesis happened, like how would we go about doing that with historical or archeological evidence? How, how would we, there would be, Abraham is not gonna leave behind evidence, right? Abraham is not, there's not, we're not gonna stumble over, you know, some inscription somewhere that says, you know, Abraham was here or something. Abraham with his wife, Sarah, and his, you know, maidservant Hagar have been here. You know, we're not going to find something like that to be able to confirm that story. Um, so as far as that kind of historical reliability is concerned, is it is it confirmed evidentially uh, by archaeological findings? Most of the Torah is simply never going to have that, um, just just in principle. Um, I'm, you, you are right that th a lot of this isn't history writing to begin with, right? These, these are sagas and legends and founding myths um, uh, for a people group a long time ago. So, uh, and, and many of the stories is, through the lens of the documentary hypothesis are gonna be edited together um, anyway. So the stories we get are, are already not the original stories that people told, but rather a, a product of many of these stories having been edited together. So, it's it's probably not trying to be history, and our ability to historically verify it is is very low, essentially regardless of the documentary hypothesis. Yeah, so it seems like what you're saying is that uh, we don't have a lot of evidence for it. We don't even know from the biblical text that it's trying to portray itself as history, and yeah. um, and in that regard, unless if you're I guess assuming it or you have extra reasons from the text to say that it's historical, then you know, there's not much of a reason to conclude that it's historical. Yeah, yeah. All right, cool. All right. Uh, so what would you say is the opinion of scholarship today on the documentary hypothesis? I think, I, I think there is broad consensus that something like the documentary hypothesis is true. Um, if um, Recently, uh, Conrad Schmid, who's uh, a sort of a proponent of the fragmentary hypothesis and is generally pretty critical of the documentary hypothesis, wrote a review of some of the work of these neo-documentaries. And, and in that, he says, you know, if, if all we're talking about is multiple independent sources edited together over time, then virtually every biblical scholar is a documentarian. Um, and and I, I think since he's he's generally hostile to this perspective, so I I think it means quite a bit for him to say that this is a general consensus. But you can also look at like introductions to the Hebrew Bible written by you know mainstream biblical scholars that are actively participating in you know society of biblical literature and stuff like that, uh, and you will find the documentary hypothesis brought up time and time again in introductions to the Pentateuch a, as a standard way that biblical scholars read this material, um, even if. I mean, every, every biblical scholar has their own sort of s small modifications or private theories about this, that, or the other thing, the dating of this source or the relation of this source or how we chop up this verse to go with this source or that. I mean, there are a million tiny variations, um, but I think it is far and away the general consensus um, it, it, uh, amongst biblical scholars, something like it, at least. Now, I've been told that, and I think Joel Baden has kind of even confirmed it in some regards, that... Uh, you know, in Europe, there's there's a lot of scholars that are going away from it. Do you know anything about that idea? Yeah, I mean, that, that would sort of be represented by uh, Conrad Schmidt, who I, who I mentioned that that European wing is is much more. First of all, they, they they're not so much interested in in looking at sources, but in the traditions that accumulate around the sources. So there's a there's a methodological difference there. Uh, they're looking at something different. Uh, most document most of the documentarians want to find sort of 
the final form of the text before it was edited into the Pentateuch. And European scholars are less concerned with that and more concerned with what was the original, bef- bef- what was like the, the core story before it began accumulating a bunch of additional information before it was then ed- edited into the, uh, the form that we have it today. So they're sort of looking at different places in the development of the text. And, that, and that, that's part of the reason why there's a difference. That's part of the reason why they prefer the fragmentary hypothesis over the, over the documentary hypothesis. Um, so moving away in the sense that they have a different set of tools that they like to use, yes. Uh, moving away in that they disagree that the Pentateuch is made up of multiple independent sources that have been edited together, no. Uh, they are still very much on board with that. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. And a uh, question for you. So, you know, you you talked about, you know, how your faith interacts with, you know, the sisteristy. But I mean, I mean, let's be honest here. Like, what you're saying is that a big part of the Bible is untrue. And, you know, that's not going to be OK with a lot of people. So why, as a Christian, are you OK with saying a big part of the Bible is untrue? Like, if it's untrue, like, what, what's even the point of that, you know, really? Uh, I'm not sure I would say untrue. I mean, I think there's a difference between saying either not historical or we can't historically prove it and not true. Um, again, if the, if the intention of these texts is, is not necessarily to do history in the way that we think of it, then we have to judge the truth of it in, in a different way. We have to have a different set of criteria for judging in what sense it's true. It's true in the sense that it, uh, it preserves authentic inherited cultural memories about the development of a Yahwism as a religion in ancient Israel. It's, it's true in that sense. Um, uh, and it can be true in, uh, in theological and existential senses without having anything to do with history at all. Um, so I, I, I don't think I would leap right from probably not historical or co- has a complicated editorial history to false. Uh, I don't I don't think those are exactly the same thing. Um, but even if it were the case, even if it were the case that some things in the text are false, again, I would go back to what I said earlier, that that simply has nothing to do with uh, does God exist? Uh, is God a trinity? Is the ato- is the incarnation? Did that happen? Is is the atonement of sin true? Is salvation by faith true? That just has nothing to do with whether or not Moses lived at what time? Was it 15th or 13th century? When did the Exodus happen? What kind of evidence that leave? it just doesn't have anything to do with that. So, yeah, gotcha. So, um, yeah, go ahead and give us what you find to be the most compelling evidence for the documentary hypothesis. And uh, just to be clear, feel free to take your time on this one. Um, I think there are, so there's like six pieces of evidence and you sort of, in a specific order. So I'd sort of say there's sort of three initial pieces of evidence that incline us to separate the text into maybe not yet sources, but sort of different strands. And then three additional pieces of evidence once we've begun that process of separation that sort of confirms that the separation is legitimate and that also what we're talking about here are real independent sources. So the first three initial pieces of evidence I would say are linguistic evidence ideological evidence and the narrative evidence. So linguistically, um, in the past 50 years or so, scholars have made a lot of progress on, um, on, on understanding the development of biblical Hebrew as a language over time. Uh, so now we are pretty confident that we are able to at least approximate the dating of texts on the basis of the style of linguistic Hebrew that we have in it. So it's very common to see biblical scholars use Uh, early biblical Hebrew to refer to texts that are probably composed prior to the monarchy, so uh, like 11th century BCE and before, Um, a middle or classical biblical Hebrew that represents uh, the Hebrew uh, from uh, during the period of the monarchy from the 10th century down to the 6th and and beginning of the, uh, down to the 6th century, and then a post-exilic late biblical Hebrew, um, which which starts in earnest in, in in the 5th century BCE. Um, so if we can make the division uh, between these different kinds of biblical Hebrew, uh, then that has an effect on the way that we think about when these texts were composed. Now, if, if, everything, in the, if everything in the Pentateuch was written at one time by one person, or even just by like a small group of people in a really concise period of time, then we would expect the biblical Hebrew to be linguistically similar, right? Just as if you took a bunch of 
you know, publications in the New York Times today, they would all have English of, of roughly the same linguistic period, right? You wouldn't, you wouldn't turn a page and find Shakespearean English, you know, spontaneously. And you certainly wouldn't find, you know, some old Germanic English mixed with some Shakespearean English mixed with some 19th century English mixed with some 21st century English alternating line by line by line down the page, right? That would be absurd to see that in a publication today. And for exactly that reason, it does not look like uh, these stories in the Pentateuch were all written by a single author because they are written with different uh, datable uh, Hebrew. So there are, there are places in the Pentateuch where we have very, very early Hebrew, uh, and there are places in the Pentateuch where we have a Hebrew that came centuries after that. And that's difficult to explain with a single author, much easier to explain with multiple authors. Um, uh, the second kind of evidence would be ideological. So in, in the text, we have any number of uh, not outright contradictions, but uh, tensions between perspective on things, um, different understandings of what kind of God God is, different understandings of the way that God interacts with human beings, different understandings about which geographic regions uh, these ancestor figures were most active in, uh, different evaluations of characters, this character evaluated in positive ways, uh, and then later spontaneously evaluated in negative ways uh, for, for next to no reason. Um, these kind of tensions are difficult to explain with a single author. Uh, they're much easier to explain with multiple authors who have conflicting perspectives on how best to characterize God, how best to characterize these human figures that appear in the story. How best, you know, which which stories are they most interested in? We have we have some stories that are very interested in places in southern Judah, and other stories that are very interested in 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 more northern locations, and you have characters sort of moving back and forth uh, in very jarring ways. Um, that's difficult to explain with a single author. Um, but I think the most compelling single piece of evidence is of a narrative nature, uh, and in particular narrative contradictions, where you have. Uh, a same or very similar story repeated with contradictory elements in it. And I think this is probably the defining piece of evidence. Uh, it certainly is for the neo-documentary and hypothesis, uh, for, for proponents of the neo-documentary hypothesis. So this is the key piece of evidence uh, that leads us to posit multiple authors. There are contradictions in the text. Genesis chapter one has a creation story. Uh, Genesis chapter two, verse five and following has a different creation story and they contradict each other in a number of places. Uh, there are two stories of the call of Abraham. There are two flood stories. There are two accounts of the revelation of the divine name to Moses. There are th three legal collections, at least in the Pentateuch much later on. There are two stories of the crossing of the Red Sea. Uh, these are called narrative doublets. Uh, one proponent of the documentary hypothesis named Richard Elliott Friedman has a list of 31 doublets um, that occur in the Pentateuch. Uh, where we have repetition and contradiction uh, between story elements. And it's very difficult to understand why a single author would do this, and especially why a single author would do this so many times in this particular genre of literature. So I think those are like the three major pieces. Um, that prompts us to sort of start thinking about different strands. And then once we do that, there's other evidence as well. Um, these different strands are tied to different historical eras. Uh, these different strands have different relations with other texts outside the Pentateuch. Uh, and these different strands have very different interests. They, they tell different stories about different things in different language with different terminology. Uh, so once we make that initial distinction, uh, the distinction is then confirmed by all this secondary evidence as well. Gotcha. You mentioned uh, by dating. So are you referring to something like uh, Deborah's song and, uh, you know, the what is it? Moses has a song like that kind of archaic Hebrew. Is that what you mean? Yeah. So a couple of our examples of the earliest Hebrew uh, in the Hebrew Bible in general are are in songs. Um, so the song of Moses, uh, the song of Deborah, the song of the sea in Exodus 15. Uh, so there are a variety of songs um, that preserve. But there is there is other instances um, of older Hebrew. I mean, generally speaking, you know, the, the Hebrew of uh, the J source uh, is older than the Hebrew of, for example, uh, D that writes Deuteronomy. Um, so that even that smaller difference 
uh, is noticeable, uh, and we can sort of map that out linguistically and tell that you know which between these two is older on linguistic grounds. And there shouldn't be if they were both written by the same person, there shouldn't be any difference at all. Um, but there's there's a significant difference there. And the way that's stated is basically you have certain words that are used and then they're not used, and then. I would assume also extra biblical texts are confirming those dates. Is that kind of how it works? Um, it's 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 not just word usage um, because words. I mean, words can be preserved and they can change meaning and stuff over time. Um, but it, it's the conjugation of verbs. It's the presence or absence of particular particles. Um, it's uh, biblical Hebrew originated from a language that has a case system, but biblical Hebrew lost that case system, but there are some remnants of that case system occasionally. Um, there are multiple ways of, for example, expressing the relative pronoun in biblical Hebrew, uh, but one is much more popular in earlier Hebrew and then sort of falls off and transforms in later Hebrew. Um, the, the latest kinds of Hebrew we have uh, reflect Aramaic influence. Um, there's no Aramaic influence uh, uh, to go around until the the uh, until the post-exilic period because Aramaic is the um, the administrative language of the Persian Empire. So no Persian Empire, no Aramaic influence. Um, so it, it's not it's not words so much that that wouldn't be a very evidentially strong ground to base it on. Um, but but it is grammar uh, and it is um, influence from other languages. Gotcha. Okay. Much appreciated it for uh, explaining that to me. Okay. So one of the biggest arguments for the documentary hypothesis, as you mentioned, is the seemingly abundant contradictions that exist between the two sources. You mentioned Genesis yeah. 1 and 2, um, you know, all throughout Genesis, Exodus, the laws, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, my question for you is, you know, how strong are these contradictions when we find other texts outside the Bible that seem to be perfectly fine with contradictions, almost like they are in a culture where they're, they're perfectly fine with, you know, saying one thing and then two minutes later saying something that contradicts it, you know, to make a different point almost. For example, the Kadesh inscription seems to contradict, the, the Kadesh inscription seems to contradict itself in the poem in the bulletin. There are many creation myths in Egypt where they seem to be conflicting in a lot of different points. The Code of Hammurabi and even texts within the Bible point to ancient peoples possibly seeing their laws as more closely related to guidelines than, you know, 21st century law texts. So, like, if we have reason to think that they're okay with contradictions, that we have other texts where one writer writes a text with contradictions in it and seems to be okay with it, why can't we say that the biblical writer is possibly doing that? Um, it would depend a bit. I mean, a, a couple of points to make. First of all, there are no contradictions outside the Bible like the Bible's contradictions, because there is no long form historical prose outside the Bible anywhere in the ancient Near East. So this is not a genre that any other group of people uh, that we have texts of is is writing in. Uh, other cultures are, are are writing in, uh, for uh, as far as like public uh, writing is concerned, you know, the epic mythic poetry or monumental inscriptions like the Kadesh inscriptions, for example. Um, but they're not writing long form historical prose. Um, so the situation is very different when you contradict on a plaque that you put up somewhere at one temple versus putting up a plaque commemorating the same event at another temple 50 miles away, like we have with, with the Kadesh inscriptions. That's a different kind of contradiction with different ramifications than a contradiction in an edited volume of a large collection of historical prose stories. So I think there's an initial question about whether or not those examples are relevant at all, simply because they reflect a very different genre and a very different attitude towards writing. Um, secondly, I mean, as far as the Kadesh inscriptions are concerned, I mean, for those who don't know, the Kadesh inscriptions are a series of monumental inscriptions written during the 13th century BCE commemorating Ramses II victory over uh, Hittite forces. Uh, and he, so far as we can tell, commissioned the composition of a bunch of both poetic and prose monumental inscriptions at like 10 different temples all throughout his kingdom uh, to commemorate his victory. Uh, whether or not, actually, whether or not he won is, is some, something of a matter of debate, but to, to commemorate the battle um, with the Hittites. 
Uh, and people have pointed out, uh, I think this is, a, this is a major element of Joshua Berman's art, uh, uh, argument against the documentary hypothesis. People have pointed out that, hey, in those instances, you know, some of these uh, monumental inscriptions contradict each other. Uh, first of all, we don't actually know whether or not these inscriptions were written by a single author. It's, it's plausible that they were commissioned by a single person, namely Pharaoh Ramses II. I mean, it seems it stands to reason he commissioned them to be composed. But whether or not they were actually written by a single person, what information they had to compose them, we simply don't have access to that. Uh, so we're doing a lot of speculation to make the Kadesh inscriptions relevant to what's happening in the Bible. But even if we assume that despite the disparity in genre, and even if we assume that it really was sort of a single author right, uh, effectively writing a single contradictory text over and over again, uh, there's not much reason to expect that this was normative during this time period. I mean, that would give us one other example. All that could tell us at most is that it's possible for a single author to contradict themselves. But we would still need to ask the question, well, which is a better explanation, right? The mere possibility alone is insufficient to overthrow the hypothesis. Which hypothesis better explains the data in the text, a single author or multiple authors? Which better explains not just the contradictions, but the linguistic evidence and the ideological evidence and, uh, 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 and all the other different kinds of evidence that we have available to us. So you can't just be like, well, it could be one person. Well, perhaps it could be one person, but what reason do we have to think it was one person is, is really the question here. Um, and I, I, so opening the door, the, you still have all the work ahead of you to show that it's actually a good explanation of the text. There, I mean, the, the, this, the situation with, with Egyptian creation stories is, is, I think, very different. I'm not aware of any Egyptian creation story that has, that, that's like a single story that has the kinds of contradictions in it that we have in like Genesis 1 and 2, for example. There are Egyptian creation stories that are intentionally written to contradict each other. Um, there's a good example of this in the 13th century, actually, uh, r roughly around the same time um, as the Kadesh inscriptions. Uh, one temple complex wrote the hymn of a tomb, which is a creation story. And then another, uh, another occultic center wrote the hymn of Ptah, uh, which makes fun of the hymn of a tomb and, and is, offers a different creation story. But these are very clearly written by two different people, two different cults. We're celebrating two different deities, sort of, you know, having a war of words back and forth. Uh, so that's a very different situation entirely. Um, so I, I don't think I don't think either of these are going to work as strong evidence against the documentary hypothesis. Uh, maybe I missed it, but I was hoping you could also comment on the laws. I mean, it seems it's a growing view, at least, that you know they they're they're seen more as guidelines. And of course, you know, if one of the biggest reasons to believe in the document documentary hypothesis is that you know three different Ten Commandments, three different um, you know, full sets of laws. Um, mm -hmm. If if those are more guidelines and you know guidelines to form a narrative, and you know, I mean, uh, I'm, I know that Tim Mackey has mentioned that like you know each time there's a story where someone messes up, it's it's like oh shoot, we need more laws, and then another story messes mm -hmm. up, you need more laws, and it's like trying to make a theological point there. Um, I mean, do you, do you see that? And like, is there, do you see that as like maybe evidence against the position or what do you think? Uh, I mean, I, I agree with the general idea that these are more like guidelines. I mean, so, so far as we know, the, the legal collections in the Torah weren't ever actually practiced as like practical jurisprudence. I mean, we have a lot of reason to think, to, to think that these were highly idealized texts that were primarily just circulated amongst priestly groups and were never actually used in like a public capacity. Um, so they are, they are more theological creations than they are like actual legal creations. Um, so I would sort of agree about that. I just, I don't think that's, that acts as evidence for or against the documentary hypothesis in, in any particular way. I mean, it, even if there are guidelines, there are still contradictory guidelines. Um, I mean, e even if they, these, this is a, a series of stories that's been revised over time, multiple authors can obviously revise earlier pieces of, uh, of text just as easily or even more easily than a single author could. Um, and some of them contradict in bizarre ways that, that aren't explainable as, as 
you know, as additions, the difference between the first Ten Commandments in Exodus 20 and the second Ten Commandments in Exodus 34 is not just a revision for to make a rhetorical point. They are completely different and have absolutely nothing in common, despite the fact that Exodus 34 introduces the Ten Commandments as exactly what was on the the, the tablets before. So that that's that's completely nonsensical. <laughs> Um, and it doesn't it doesn't help to be like, well, they're just guidelines. I mean, that that doesn't that doesn't help explain why there's this difference between them. Um, and I mean, if, if you could find an individual instance where, you know, there's a law against something and the Israelites do something wrong. And so that individual law is updated. That would make sense. And, and I could buy into this alternative explanation then. But there's no reason, for example, to update laws on slavery between, you know, in the 40 years wandering the wilderness, when did they purchase foreign slaves while wandering in the wilderness? Like, what would give the inspiration to radically change to have three different sets of slave laws in a time period where they probably don't have slaves? I mean, they don't have debt slaves because they're not actively doing agriculture while they're wandering around in the in the middle of the desert. And they don't have the means to import foreign chattel slaves. So why is there such a significant development in in the in the laws related to slaves? Right. Why are they composing laws uh, that have to do with people in, in, in settled places while they're wandering around in the wilderness? Right. Why, why is are there laws about how a king should rule in Deuteronomy, which is hypothetically set in the 15th century, almost 500 years before there is a king? Right. So there is not much. I don't think that they are dynamically. One author is dynamically responding to unfolding events is a very good explanation for the actual kinds of changes that we get between these different legal collections. Gotcha. Okay, so more theological here. So if Genesis 1 isn't historical, I mean, doesn't that mean we aren't made in the image of God? Uh, no, because the claim that we're made in the image of God is not a historical claim. Uh, it's a metaphysical claim about what's essential to human nature, and it's an existential claim about what the human condition is like. Um, and I, I would expect a claim like that to be written in a philosophically speculative or, or mythic style. That makes sense for that. I mean, if you look at, um, I mean, this is kind of far afield, but uh, about 100 years after Genesis 1 is written, you have some of our first uh, pre-Socratic philosophers in, Greek, in Greece who are using myths to do philosophical speculation about what human nature is like. So it seems entirely appropriate to me that you would you would describe a, a you know, the, uh, an ultimate description about human nature and cast it in, in the form of a myth. That's, that's par for the course. Um, if it were a specific historical claim, like, you know, in 4006 BCE, God made a person in the image of God and we all descend from them. And that's the only way that you could possibly be made in the image of God is if you descend from them, then yeah, that would be maybe a big problem. Um, but I don't take Genesis one to be saying that. So I don't, I don't see any issue there. Gotcha. I, I definitely think that we are made in the image of God. I don't think the documentary hypothesis uh, would change that. Yeah, that's something definitely something to think about. So what about sin? I mean, if Genesis 2 to 3 didn't happen, what sin did Jesus die for? Uh, our sin. <laughs> Jesus died for our sins. Uh, Jesus dies for our sins regardless of who else sins. I mean, I've sinned, you've sinned, everybody's sinned. Um, that's the whole point. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so, you know, while we are sinners, Christ dies for us, right? Christ doesn't, Jesus doesn't die for us because Adam sinned. Jesus dies for us because we have sinned. Um, so I, I'm, I, it, I mean, in a sense, the, the very existence of Christianity sort of answers this question because it's not until the fifth century um, CE and, and the development of the doctrine of original sin by Augustine that you really get this strong connection between the sin of Adam and, 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 and the rest of human sin. So prior to this, there are, there are Christians who obviously feel a need um, to, to repent and to, um, you know, to believe in the resurrection and the atonement who have no idea that this has anything at all to do with Adam. There's no concept of, of inherited guilt um, or, or something like that that would need to be um, cleansed by Jesus. So I, I think most people, most Christians prior to that, just think that Jesus dies for their sin. I mean, that's what the text says. That's what Romans says. Um, 
so I mean, that I again, whether or not Genesis two, three, or anything like that are historical is, is irrelevant to whether or not human beings have sinned and whether or not Jesus is the solution for that sin. Hmm. But I mean, in some ways, it's like, all right, if if we don't know where sin came from, it's like, how, how do we know we even have sin to begin with? Does that make sense? If I'm sorry, what? If if we, I mean, if if Genesis, you know. Uh, three is explaining the origination of sin. It seems Mm -hmm. like we would have a hard time knowing where sin came from. And like, if we even have sin, if we don't have this text, that's, that's what a lot of people are going to be dealing with. What do you think about that? Well, I mean, no, because I mean, the basic idea still carries over that sin is disobedience uh, of uh, is disobedience of God. I mean that that's that's true regardless of whether or not Adam Adam and Eve existed or disobeyed God, and that that, that remains true in our lives as well. So uh, we would still be sinning in moments where we disobey uh, God, or where we are unrighteous, or where we exhibit sinful vices. Or I mean, the New Testament has a lot of different ways to explain what sin is and where sin comes from. Jesus never talks. <laughs> Jesus, Adam and Eve are sort of interesting figures. They occupy a large space in our imagination, but they're virtually unmentioned in the Bible. I mean, the Adam in, and what happens in Eden is literally never mentioned again in the entire Old Testament. Uh, Adam and Eve are never mentioned again, except in like one genealogy, one place. Uh, Jesus only talks about Adam and Eve on like two occasions, once to, to make a point about divorce and has, has nothing to do with sin. Right. And then Adam appears in a genealogy in the Gospel of Luke. Um, so it's entirely possible to literally write a gospel and, and not refer to. Uh, this inherited sin, you can explain the entire significance of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus without needing to invoke these stories in Genesis, uh, as the gospel authors did. Um, and so I don't see any, I don't think it's necessary either. I mean, if it's not necessary for Mark and Matthew to do it, I, I don't I don't feel compelled to do it. I, I don't think I need to either. <laughs> well said. Okay. So I got a question for Sarah. Are you okay with the writers in the New Testament being wrong every time they refer to something that happened to the Torah. Like, doesn't that hinder our ability to trust Jesus when he said he was the son of God if he's referring to these fake fake stories or stories that never happened, almost as if they're historical? Uh, No, again, I mean, it's it's sort of, you can refer to a story um, especially in like a rhetorical, oops, especially in like a rhetorical context or a pedagogical context where you're trying to make a point or you're trying to teach a lesson, you can refer to a story without that story being historical. And whether it's historical or not doesn't change the way that you refer to the story. So if I'm trying to, you know, I don't know, if 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 I'm trying to make a point about friendship and I'm like, you know, you got to be friends like Frodo and Sam are friends from Lord of the Rings, Right. And I talk about, you know, Frodo did this and Sam did this and Frodo said that and Sam said that and look at how strong their friendship was. I talk about that event as though I talk about these characters and the events that transpire in this film and the book before it as though they happened, even though they're fiction. You wouldn't know that they are fictional it, just by my reference. You, you would have no idea whether or not this is a nonfiction story or a fictional story merely because I'm referring to it. So when... Jesus or the disciples or Paul refers to characters who may or may not have existed in order to demonstrate some theological point or some moral point. I don't think the point of that reference is to teach that those events are historical, but rather to teach whatever moral lesson or theological lesson they're trying to make. Right Uh, When Jesus refers to Uh, Adam and Eve in the garden to make a point about divorce. The point is not that they actually existed, but that there's this time, you know, a long time ago when marriage was supposed to be permanent. That was an original intention. And then that, you know, Jesus is making this point that it's because of the hardness of people's hearts that he that uh, Moses permitted divorce. Right. There's this changing understanding. God is compromising with human beings. This is a theological um, explanation that Jesus is giving. Uh, none of that requires that Adam and Eve actually existed. The theological lesson would be uh, as impactful and as true uh, regardless, just like my you know, il- illustration of Frodo and Sam and their, and their friendship together. 
God. So I don't think the I don't think the New Testament writers are wrong. I just think they're using the stories in non-historical ways. Mm-hmm. Um, so question for you, like, what is it like being Christian and believing in the documentary hypothesis? You know, when you it's great. <laughs> When you, I mean, when you're sitting in a sermon at church, they're talking about, you know, Abraham or Isaac and, you know, all, or Joseph and, and going to Egypt. I mean, yeah. as, as a Christian, like, what is it like? Like, you're just saying like, oh, that that's historical, like that's meaningless. Or, I mean, it, doesn't, it almost seems for a lot of people that it's going to take the purpose out of the entire book, doesn't it? No, I, I don't think so. I mean, w- when I'm in church and I'm listening to a sermon, I, I'm not there to do source criticism, right? <laughs> I, I am there to worship and to fellowship and to participate in Christian rituals and to experience the presence of God. Uh, I, I am there to do church stuff. I'm not there to do biblical scholarship or to dissect or analyze the text or something like that. Uh, and that's that's an important thing to be able to, I mean, to turn off, right? To to, to just like, just like when you're appreciating anything, if you're going to watch a film, but you're going to critique it while you do it, you're not going to appreciate the film, right? You're going to be like, oh, the lighting, the camera could have, the shot could have been a little bit different, or, you know, you're, you're going to get caught up in all these, um, these critical things. And the, and the same thing applies to, uh, you know, me going to church. I think the documentary hypothesis has caused me to appreciate the Bible more. Um, it's it's a, a tremendous act of a creative artistry to edit together the text in the way that it has been. Um, and the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Um, the, the, the Pentateuch that we have now is um, an amazingly complex uh, piece of art, right? A- as a result of having been threaded together out of multiple independent sources. Um, so to, to me, it looks as a result of the documentary hypothesis looks like, you know, a, a, a remarkable jewel. I, I, th- I think its value is only increased. I, I think it would I think its value would decrease if I, th- I would be constantly be asking the question, why is a single author contradicting themselves? Why is a single author jumping around in their storytelling? Why does a single author have so many different conflicting ideas about who God is and, 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 and how God works? I, I would. I would become distrustful of that single author. This this person seems schizophrenic, right? I don't understand what they're trying to do here. So I, I think for me, it's it's quite the opposite. I, uh, the documentary hypothesis, if anything, has made me appreciate the Bible more. Gotcha. So back to the more scholarly question. So what, in your opinion, would it take for you to reject the documentary hypothesis? Well, I, I believe in the documentary hypothesis because I, th- I think it's the best explanation of the scriptural data. So in order for me to not believe in it, uh, somebody would need to have an alternative explanation that better explains the scriptural data. Right. I mean, there was a time when I didn't believe in the documentary hypothesis and, and I became persuaded because of its explanatory power and scope and because of its relative simplicity. Uh, so something would need to come along that has better explanatory power and better explanatory scope and is more simple. Right. It would need to have... Um, uh, uh, it would need to do a better job of explaining the same things uh, than the documentary hypothesis. There would need to be a better explanation for the variety of linguistic features in the text. There would need to be a better explanation for the narrative contradictions in the text. There would need to be a better explanation for the tensions and conflicting ideologies in the text. Um, and if, if someone came along and did that, then I would, I would be happy to get on board with whatever that thing is that does a better job of explaining it. Gotcha. Now, uh, for someone who, you know, say they, they've been convinced, you did a great job. Good job, Aaron. <laughs> um, say, say they've been convinced by you. Uh, but, you know, at the same time, you know, they, they see you're a Christian, but they're like, you know, they're still having issues with the historicity and, you know, almost like uh, doubting the Bible kind of thing. If, if one thing is false and the rest of it's false kind of thing. Um, like, what would you say to that person that's, that's struggling with that? that thinks you're right, but also, um, you know, is still having an issue with their faith. Um, I mean, what I would encourage young Christians, I mean, my, my primary job is a, is a, is a university instructor. And, and so I interact with, you know, young Christians who are 18 to 22 years old all the time. And my general advice for strengthening people's faith 
it is to get more reasons to believe in God. Um, and I primarily recommend this through apologetics, uh, through the study of uh, very basic philosophy and philosophical arguments for God's existence. Um, if you just believe in God because you have because you grew up with a book, that, that's a terrible reason to believe in God. And it's a, it's a reason to believe in God that's going to wither away and die the second that you move away from that community or that community hurts you, God forbid. Um, or you have reason to doubt members of that community or your relationship with people in that community deteriorates. Um, so that's a very vulnerable reason to believe in this just because you have a book, right? I mean, uh, Muslims have a book. Everybody, everybody's got a book, right? Everybody's got some scripture that they can point to. The book is not a good enough reason by itself. It's, it's not an enduring reason. I generally recommend... Um, uh, at least an introductory knowledge of apologetics, have at least a couple of ways to reason your way to God. Um, and so in, in particular, because those reasons are going to outlast any wrestling you do with the Bible, right? It's an entirely separate um, reason to to believe. Than, than, and, and that way, if you're on good terms with the Bible or bad terms with the Bible, or you discover something new about the Bible that you didn't know before, that's not going to have any impact. Otherwise, your study of the Bible is a very uh, almost dangerous thing to do, right? And I think this is the situation that a lot of young Christians are actually in. There, there's almost a certain hesitancy to study the Bible because they're afraid that they're going to turn the page and find something they don't like. And that's that's entirely, you will do that. I mean, it's not even like on, you are going to turn the page in the Bible someday and you're going to see God commanding genocide. You're going to turn the page in the Bible someday, and you're going to see, you know, some horrific, um, you know, uh, mass sexual violence or something. Like you're going to see absolutely atrocious things in the Bible. And if the only reason you were believing in all this religiony stuff is because you thought the Bible was nice, or a love letter from God, or one of these other sort of Disney-fied versions of the Bible that many of us carry around with us. Uh, then that belief is going to shatter immediately. Um, so I would recommend get other uh, cultivate a, a a a meditative and prayer life that 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 facilitates your direct experience of God. Study apologetics so you have a reason to believe in God, and those two things will help fortify your biblical study. Then, uh, so that you can go into that, you know, you can throw all your cards on the table. You can face every argument down. Uh, you will never be scared of anything in the Bible. Because you have other reasons for if, uh, other reasons for your core beliefs besides the text. Awesome. Well, very, very well said. Okay. Thank you so much for coming on here. That's all the questions I got for you. This has been a great time. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, well, I've enjoyed it too. It's fun. I like doing this. Awesome. Stuff. Sweet. So, uh, can you give us just basically um, uh, a general overview of what you do on your TikTok? I would strongly encourage you guys to check it out. Just get people interested in what you're doing there. Sure. My, my, is it a username? I think it's a, my username <laughs> is ABH Bible uh, on TikTok. I've been on there. I think I don't even know now, probably, probably almost two years now. Um, I post a video uh, every day or almost every day, at least um, just trying to give an academic perspective uh, on uh, different parts of the Bible. Mo most of my content is responding to questions uh, that people have written in. I've, I've done some small Bible study series before, and I, I'm planning another one right now that will go, there'll be a commentary on, on the book of Chronicles for people who are interested in sort of a more sustained kind of treatment. But 90% of my comment is, 90% uh, of my content is just responding to people's questions. Uh, people, it, it's sort of an opportunity to ask whatever you ever wanted to ask about the Bible. Um, and, and, and I respond to that with scholarly resources. I, I, rec I regularly make book recommendations if people want to uh, do more biblical scholarship on their own. Um, and I, I try to have as little of sort of my opinion as possible. I, I'm not really there to just talk about my thoughts on things. I am there, although there's a, inevitably that's going to be part of it. But I try to minimize that and I try to um, bring the opinions of major biblical scholars to the table so that people can see uh, what these scholars are, are thinking and saying and, and why they are saying it. Yeah, I know I can go and watch your video and I'll definitely learn something just because you have that scholarly perspective that, you know, doesn't necessarily get out to the lay people very well. So it's it's always something to learn, something to learn more. I, I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> awesome. All right. Thank you so much for coming on here, Aaron. This has been so great. And I hope everyone uh, 
enjoyed this and uh, just go go follow follow Aaron and uh, everyone. I hope you have a great rest of your day, Aaron. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Yes, on. awesome. It's been great.